You're watching the Tech History Channel, revisiting the moments that shaped our present. From a disappointing art student according to his professor, and a talented programmer applying his mind at half capacity as a hacker at a local hacker club, way back when the internet was not even a thing, to becoming technology rock to destroying the world with a completely new invention no one had seen before, to starting a company, to realizing someone stole their idea, and then suing that giant corporation for over $700 million for stealing their idea. Which, by the way, they offer for free. This is the story of how two German guys invented the digital globe literally and went against the biggest companies of them all, Google, after they stole their idea. Allegedly, of course. If you already watched the Netflix documentary based on this true story, stick around as we are going to be discussing some important things Netflix missed out in your documentary. As the director said, quote, the filmmakers didn't hope to reestablish justice. They simply wanted to portray the ideals that initially drove the tech generation and what it ultimately turned into, end quote. We will try to uncover the hidden details and events that led to the epic Goliath vs. David fight between Google and Terrorvision, and ultimately how Goliath won. Without further ado, let's begin. It's the 1990s in the atmosphere of Berlin's post-unification era, with its techno clubs, its wildly experimental art scene, and its hackers, who weren't taken seriously at that point. It was a time when having an actual bank account felt like being a part of the establishment, and young people had found their own way of being cool. At this point in history, the internet embodied dreams of revolution and freedom without borders. The idea that all knowledge could be available to everyone was incredibly new and exciting at the time. It was during this time when an art student would meet a computer hacker in one of Berlin's notorious techno clubs. The art student, whose real name is Joachim Suiza, wanted to create a digital art project at a time when computers were barely gaining mainstream popularity and he had founded an organization called Art Plus Com, or Art and Com in German. Art and Com was an art collective founded on the idea that technological advancements will be driven by collaboration between art and computers, hence the name Art Plus Com. He had an idea to show the globe as a 3D graphical digital sphere to submit as an art project for his master's degree. Similarly, the computer hacker called Pavel Meyer, who was a part of a group called Chaos Monkeys, would engage in hacks of big corporate companies they felt were too powerful and didn't conform to their worldview, had also been fascinated by the idea of a globe from a young age. He would envision a world in which anyone could just travel the globe using their computer and be able to fly anywhere at any time to where they wanted to be. The pair decided that they wanted to build such a program. Reluctantly, the pair realized that they needed some investors, and that came in the form of Deutsche Telekom, a big telecommunications company in Germany at the time. Deutsche Telekom, as a part of an agreement with the German government, was required to invest a percentage of their profits into new tech companies in Germany. After being sold on the vision of Terrorvision, they decided that they would invest in the startup even though they didn't know yet how they would bring their vision to life. Deutsche Telekom made their pair agree that the program would be ready in about a year's time for the world's biggest telecommunications conference in Kyoto, the ICU conference. Shortly before they had to leave for the telecommunications conference in Kyoto, Deutsche Telekom wanted to see the project to make sure it was ready for the conference. The problem was, Terrorvision wasn't ready. It kept crashing because of the overload of data. They knew they couldn't show it to Deutsche Telekom because they would pull the plug on the project if they saw how glitch it was and stop funding it. Joachim decides to pre-script a series of different locations for the investors. In other words, they completely hoodwinked them with a fake program until they could get the proper program in place. He accomplished this by researching the history of the Deutsche Telekom investors, things like where they were born and where they went to school. Etc. He would make them think that they were choosing these locations on their own, but in reality, he had pre scripted the entire thing. The move was genius. The Deutsche Telekom representatives were very impressed. They left without suspecting a thing and they were very excited to see how the program would be received at the ICU conference. 
In fact, even in Kyoto, the program only just managed to come together an hour before it had to be demonstrated. It only takes one mind to be blown by the presentation before everyone else in the conference starts getting involved, including the then Secretary of State of the United States of America. The program became so popular that the two founders of Terrorvision would spend the next year touring the world and demonstrating Terrorvision to mesmerized audiences. The pair headed to Silicon Valley a little while after the tour, as they were invited by a Silicon Graphics employee who had tried to build a program like Terrorvision but concluded it was impossible. The fictional name of this character in Billion Dollar Code is Brian Anderson, whose real name I can't say because I don't want to be sued. Silicon Graphics was working with Terrorvision to show off their powerful Onyx computer capabilities to the rest of the computer industry. Brian was SGI's designated representative and contact person for the collaboration, and he frequently discussed details about Terrorvision with the Terrorvision team. He eventually went as far as trying to offer the lead programmer behind Terrorvision, Pavel, a job at Silicon Graphics, but he turned it down and decided instead that he would go back to Berlin with his co-founder and try to get the company off the ground. But they had a problem. They needed between 5 to 7 million Deutschmarks to get a CD-ROM version of Terrorvision going so that an average user could use it, along with an integrated phone book built in that would essentially replace the yellow pages. To achieve this, they decided to bring in new investors. But the trouble was, no one was willing to part ways with the cash needed. And in Germany, everything was lagging behind the US, so all the investors wanted to invest in US-based tech companies. And to add to their problem, the computer needed to run the software, the Onyx, designed by Silicon Graphics, costed upwards of $100,000, and this was during the 1990s. As if that wasn't enough, Deutsche Telekom stopped pouring money into the venture, as they were no longer obligated by the German government to keep investing in new German startups. For Pavel, this was a massive blow, especially given the fact that they could have gone with Brian and Silicon Graphics. But eventually, the dot-com bubble begins to settle in in Germany, and the pair are able to raise money to stay afloat as they try to build out their revolutionary program. The only trouble is, Brian had left Silicon Graphics and started his own company called Keyhole. Keyhole developed a program called Keyhole Earth Viewer, which essentially did the exact same thing as Terrorvision and had received funds from the CIA's VC fund called InQtel. The CIA and the Department of Defense were very interested in the program as it could completely revolutionize how they strategized for wars. Instead of using paper maps and pictures, they could use real-time 3D renderings of an area and use that information to effectively attack the enemy. It is important to note that while Terrorvision was touring the world, Pavel noticed that a large portion of the business cards they received were from military departments of specific countries, but they had refused to allow Terrorvision to be used for military applications. In 2004, Google acquired Keyhole and Brian became a member of the Google Earth project. A demo of the product was soon released after the acquisition. As Joachim and Pavel watched the demo online in horror, they realized that the idea was being copied. All of this seems to have stemmed from Pavel opening up to Brian and telling him everything about the algorithm during their drunken time in California. Initially, they didn't want to assume that Google stole the idea, so they set up a meeting with Brian where it was made clear that Google wants to collaborate with them on the idea. As part of the deal, the Terrorvision team would have to send Google all the relevant documents about the Terrorvision program. But Google later backtracks on the deal and decided they no longer wanted to collaborate with Terrorvision as they believed that Google Earth was different from Terrorvision and did not infringe on the patent that Terrorvision had filed for and received in the United States of America. Thus, Google concluded that the Terrorvision team would no longer be of value to the Google Earth team. Thanks for watching the Tech History Channel.